Hi, this is Scott Ferrier from Ferrier's Maple Bee Farm. Um, this is, I guess, would be called your COVID beginner's beekeeping class because uh, we're not having people in to do the class this year. So, sending this out to the people that were supposed to come but weren't able to because we've, uh, we've canceled all the classes for this year. Um, Okay, so never done a video before of a class, so this could be interesting. I'll try and speak up so you can hear me. Um, so first thing when you're getting bees is make sure you want to have bees. <laughs> the second thing would be to set up a place for um, for them to be, like pick a spot best with the uh, some sort of a, a wind block to the north northwest in that area and uh, just to block the wind in the winter time and it's best to have sun um, all day long lots of people think you need to put them in the shade but we're in northern Ontario we don't need to put them in the shade um, we're not in Georgia or Florida so we don't have to worry about them getting that hot. There might be a couple days of the year that they're not very productive because it's too warm. But uh, for the most cases, you're better off in full sunlight so that they will get out and work for more of the day. Um, these lights suck. Okay. Um, so we'll find a place for them. Uh, you need to set up an electric fence for bears, uh, because if a bear gets into them, you're done. Yeah. You're done for the season. Um, so best to uh, have a good fence up. Um, I buy my stuff from Trout Creek Feed Store, but just about any feed store will have the things you need to set up an electric fence. And then you need to um, have something to put them on uh, to get them off the ground so that they're away from like slugs and mice and snakes and things like that. Uh, it's not very fun when you open up a hive and there's a snake inside. It sort of freaks you out. It's happened to me a few times. Um, so what I do is I put I put them on skids. Some people put them on cement blocks. Um, some put them on a patio stone on top of cement blocks. It's just uh, whatever you can think of to get them up off the ground. That keeps the moisture out of them as well as keeping uh, rodents and, and uh, snakes and slugs and things like that out of them. Um, I will be reading up from my notes because this is the first class of the year and probably the last class of the year and I can't remember that well. Um, you're also getting them off the ground also kill, keep your equipment dry so then it doesn't rot as, as fast. Um, when you pick up your nucleus colony it will most likely be in the evening um, because that way you're sure that all your field bees are back in the box. Uh, you don't want to be going home with just half your bees. So that's why it's an evening pickup for... Uh, I can possibly have them for early morning. I wouldn't go much past 9 o'clock. If somebody wanted to come and pick them up and let me know the night before, I could close them in for them. Um, but if you were here past 9 o'clock, I'd let them back out of the box. Cause, uh, I'm not going to trap them in a box on a hot day in the summertime. Um, it's also best by picking them up at night, that's the best way to transport them as well. So it's cooler at night, the sun's not hitting them, so if they're in the back with an open pickup or something, um, nighttime is the best time to, to move these. They also don't, uh, they don't come out of the box as much at night, and they don't come out as much 
when you're transporting them. But uh, usually we have them all screened in well and everything so they can't get out. Because most people pick up their cars and SUVs and things like that. And so we try and get them taped up real good so they can't get out. Uh, when you take your new cone, because it's at night, you just take it over and say this is my cement uh, pad or pallet or whatever. Just take your nuke over and set it right where it's it's going to be in the in the full size hive. You're not going to transfer them at night because uh, they're just too cranky. Then you just finish moving them and shaking them and everything. So you just you can actually have your hive set up like this, the single bottom box, and carry your nuke over, set it on top of that box, and then I would give them five to ten minutes to calm down after just shaking them all the way over here, and then just pull the tape or whatever's uh, closing the front, pull that off, and walk away. Um, you might want to have your suit on when you're doing that. Uh, depends on if you've had these before, you know what it feels like to get stuck. So um, just peel the front off, walk away, come back and deal with them in the next day, like at 10 or noon or something when they're nice and when they're all calmed down. And you transfer them into your other box. It's, they, it's not hard for them to transfer from this height down to there. It's like only a foot. They'll figure it out really quick. Um, Um, next day you uh, go out to your you go out to your hive. Um, you could just set this box aside. Set it close, um, and then open up your hive. And if you don't have it set up already, um, set it up. Um, this one was set up already and it has 10 frames in it. So what you do is you go to the center of the box and you take five out. Even though you're only putting four in, you take five out. So basically you have five in here. You need a total of six altogether plus the nucleus colony to fill the box. So you make that space. You go to your nucleus colony. And pull the lid off and you can hit that on there and all the bees will fall in there if you want to or you can just throw it out in front of the hive and they'll figure it out. Um, now you go to your nucleus colony and you and you pop your uh, frames out. Start with the outside one because it's probably a honey frame or it'll be an empty but cold frame. So it's less likely that the queen will be on there. So you pull that one out. If you like, you can check it. Just see what's going on with it. If the queen, if it, it's what the one that's pulled, um, the queen could already have laid in it. She could be on it. Um, you just transfer that into the box. You keep it away from the other frame when you're setting it in the box because you don't want to roll your bees against the other frame. Because if you do that, it could uh, kill the it could kill the queen. So you just set it in there. You go to the next one. You pull it out. It should have brood on it in some state. It could have hatched out. Queen's laying in it. It could be uh, open, partially open brood, or it could be calf brood, most likely calf brood. Take it and set it in the box again, away from the other one, and then you can slide them together. Okay, and then go to the next one, do the same thing, check it out, into the box, the next one, same thing, check it out, into the box. And then 
push those all together and keep all those frames that you've got in your nuke together. Okay? They're just going into a new home and it would be probably easier for them if everything sort of looked the same as it was in the other box, but it's in a bigger box, right? Then once you have those in there, slide these ones against those and then take your last one and the whole purpose of this was to give yourself lots of room so you don't kill a lot of bees. Okay, and you put this one on the outside. And then, then if you're anal like me, you'll center them. And then you put your inner cover on. Sorry, you know, with two parts. This is an inner cover. Um, the ones you get from us are usually on this side. It's it's like hollow for about an inch and a quarter. This side is totally flat. Um, in the in the summer you'll put the totally flat side down against the frames like that. They don't really need to travel over top of the frame. Um, they'll travel around both ends and underneath. And actually, even with that being flat on there, they can still travel over the top. There's enough room. Uh, you don't squish bees just because that's a flat surface because the frames are down in the box a little bit. So you put that on. And then you put this on, and you walk away. You're done for a week or so. And I suggest uh, coming back and checking them once a week. You're checking them to make sure that there's a sign that there's a queen in there. Um, you're looking for other things like uh, possible disease. So if there's little pinholes in the capping, um, and there's a dead larvae in there. You should uh, do some more research to find out what it could possibly be. There's more than one thing it could be. Um, anyway, let's uh, go into that a little later. Um, now, for when you transfer them into this big hive, there's they're going to look really super busy. Okay, and the same thing in the morning when the nucleus colony is sitting on the top of the box because they're in a new place so they just go out in short flights and try to figure out where they are they orient themselves that way and uh, anyways I didn't mention when you're done with this if you're sure the queen's in the box then just leave it like that otherwise you may want to tap it on its end and dump it into the box or you can just lay it out in front of the box like that and the bees will make their way in. Because there will be some stragglers in the box. Um, now the main thing uh, when you're when you have a nucleus colony and you're starting with the nucleus colony your main job as a beekeeper is to give them room. So um, you come back, check your hive um, every week. Some people will say 10 days. Every beekeeper will tell you a different amount of time. Some people will tell you two weeks. Um, I say seven days because I've been caught and lost the swarm by going for the for the 10 day period. So. I do a little more often than most, um, but if you're, you're managing them well and you've given them enough room and everything, then you're you're probably pretty safe at ten for ten days. It's just if they get too packed in there, they will go, they'll swarm on you, and you lose half of your bees. But what you do is every uh, well, I do it every week. Every week I go to the hive, open it up, oh, sorry, every week I go to the hive, light my smoker, okay, and 
smoke the front of the hive. Just give it a couple puffs, okay? And then uh, give them a second and then pull the lid off. Give them another puff down through the hole if you want. And then just lift this a bit, give them a little puff under there. And that, the smoke keeps them calm. Um, my uncle says they, that uh, it makes them think that their house is on fire, so they bury their head in their honey to get enough honey to build a new house for the next place they're going. I don't know. They're a little more calm when you use smoke. Anyway. So when you go to inspect your hive, you pry the the first one, the outside one over because again the outside ones are usually honey um, or open frames. So you can push that aside and pull that outside one out, and that gives you room to work all the rest of the frame. So you just pry them sideways. And then this hook is to hook under the edge of them. You keep them close enough. You hook under the edge of them because they'll stick them down with propolis. So you just hook them until they're loose and then you can grab onto them with your hand. You pull them out and inspect them. Look into the cells and see if you can see the eggs and the larvae. And uh, if there's brood on it, you look at them and, and see if there's anything fishy there that looks a little off uh, like a dead black larvae or maybe a, a I think they call them chalk brood which is you'll see like a looks like the back end of a bee but it's just um, it looks like a piece of chalk in the in the uh, in the comb now that there's really no medication or anything for that but um, if you know you have it the best thing to do is to elevate the hive uh, a little bit so that they get more air if it's got a screen bottom board pull this thing out uh, just um, what I do is if they're on a solid bottom board I'll change them to a screen bottom board and elevate them so there's no, not as much moisture and then just let them get as strong as possible and they usually clean it up. Um, so you just keep doing the same thing all the way through the box. You pry them sideways, you hook onto it, pull it up, check for the queen, check for larvae, check to see what they're what they're doing exactly. Um, now, like I said, the uh, most important part is to give them the most important part of your job is to give them room. So, um, what they say is when this box is about 80% full, you need to get another box on. Okay. So, anything, if you go into it and they're, they have more than six frames, so there's like two on the outside on either side or something that aren't pulled, you got to start thinking about uh, giving them more room because in a week they can get a long way, right? They could pull those frames out, and uh, or there could be right after you inspect them the next day there could be a huge hatch. And uh, so for every one frame like this of brood that that they have in the hive, when it hatches, it can the bees out of it, if it's a good solid frame of brood, could actually cover three frames with bees. So just one frame, because of the way they're oriented, when they come out and they're uh, the other way, they can cover as much as three frames. So if you're looking at six frames, uh, I would probably, at that point, think about uh, think about putting on another box. So when you're putting on another box, if you went in here, there's eight frames of bees, say, okay, there's ten frames in there all together, so 80% will be eight frames. If there's that many bees in there, you need to get another box on. Okay? 
Okay, so you have another box, 10 frames in it. Um, what I like to do, and what everyone should do, because it makes more sense, is uh, just take one of the center, at least one of the center frames out, and go into your bottom box, and pull out a frame that's pulled, uh, as long as it's pulled, uh, pulled meaning that the comb is deeper, uh, so they can lay eggs in it or put honey in it. Okay, so put one of these blank ones down in the bottom and put one that's pulled uh, up into the top. You know, just pulled with honey and pollen in it, it's good enough. And put that up there. If you want to do two, and put a blank one in between or something, that's fine too. Then you just take that and you set it on top. And you just gave them room. You just gave them the room that they needed so that they won't swarm on you. Now, and you just put the lid back on and, and you're done again for another week before you come back again. Um, usually, uh, when you first put your nucleus colony in a box, I find it takes two to three weeks before they get out of the bottom box and into the, and in, and needing the second box. So, it's a good, uh, and then, same again, because, same for the top box, even though the bottom box, they only have to pull out six frames to get it full, because you're putting four good frames in from the nucleus colony. By the time they've expanded and got out of that box and need a second box, there's a lot more bees in there. So when you put the second box on top, they're going to do the thing. It's going to take them about uh, two to three weeks, and they're going to be have that box up to the point where you need to put another box on. Um, so. In the first year having a nucleus colony, sometimes you'll make some honey, sometimes you won't. Sometimes you'll miss a swarm cell, um, and they'll swarm on you, and there's not much chance of making honey at that point in your first year. Um, but sometimes they will get up in, into a honey super and they'll make you some honey. And even if they don't, I usually suggest to people that when it's getting like if you don't think they're going to make any honey and it's like the middle of August take one of those frames out that's full of honey in there and just scrape it off just so that you can get a couple jars and get the flavor of what you're searching for. Anyway, if they do get to the point where they get this second box three quarters full you open it up and if you see them getting so that there's five or six frames in this top so you're sort of iffy about if you need to put another box on or not, uh, a really good thing to do would be take one of your frames that aren't pulled, like this one is an unpulled frame, so it has, as you can see, it's just flat here. So if if you see see that in a week or so, you're probably going to have to put on a third box. I would take one of these and take a blank one of these out and put it in here because you can't transfer a pulled frame from this big box into a medium honey super. So you need them to pull that out so that you can stick it up into the honey super and that will attract them up because they don't like going up into a full box of unpulled frames. So when they say unpulled, pulled, this is an unpulled frame. It's hard to see with the lighting. This one's a pulled frame. So, so this is unpulled, so you can see it's flat. And this one's 
pulled. So you can see the comb is actually out even with the wood, whereas this one's indented. Not very good lighting here. The best I can do is not being a video guy. Anyway, put that in there. Leave that in there for the week that you're waiting before you put your other super on. And then when you come back to put the other super on, you can pull this out and put this back in. So you push these across and put it on the outside. Um, now, they will have hopefully have pulled this out. Okay. And if they pulled it out, she could have laid eggs in it or something, but that's okay because you're not going to take that honey super off in less than 21 days. So, before you put that super on, you put on, this is called a clean excluder. Uh, the reason it's called that is because the clean is too fat to get up through these little bars, but all the workers can get up through there. So they can bring the honey up into it, up into the honey super. Um, not everyone uses a medium, so this is called a medium, so this is 6 and 5 eighths here. This is called a deep, and that's 9 and 5 eighths, okay. So those are usually used for the brood. Um, I use them for honey supers as well, but that's because I need a lot of comb pulled for the new. But um, the deep, if you filled that full of honey, you would be in the area of 80 pounds of honey. And, and a medium is only about 50 to 60 pounds. So they're a lot easier to handle. Um, there's not as much weight, like 80 pounds is a lot of weight. And uh, so, so we have in a honey super you brought that frame up that was pulled, okay? Now, just stick it in the center somewhere, okay? But, in these bottom boxes we have 10 frames. In this box, you only put 9 frames. And the reason for that is, you want extra space in between the frames, so that when they pull the comb out, they pull it out past the frame. So then you can cut it off with you, you put your knife across here. You put your knife across between the wooden pieces, then then you take the capping off. So you'll cap that off um, once the honey is cured. Once it is honey, before that is considered nectar. Okay, and then you can cut that capping off easily with a knife, right? If you have it too narrow, it, it's harder to, to do that. So, anyways, you put these in, and the way I do it is I actually place my hand because I just have too much going on to carry my tool. You just put a little in between them, maybe a quarter of an inch somewhere in there, and that'll space them out um, really good in a in nine frame. Or you can use one of these, which is called a nine frame spacer, and you just it makes it so that you can just set it on top, and it gives you proper spacing. Um, either way works. This is another tool you have to carry, but for most people, if they just have a couple hives, that's not a big deal. They can leave it hanging somewhere, even in the bee yard. Um, so you put that on there, and then you put your inner cover and lid on, and you wait until next inspection, so another week or days or whatever interval it is you want to do. Um, another 10 days you come back, 
And a lot of people at this point will stop doing the whole hive inspection and just keep giving them room. Now sometimes that'll work out, sometimes they'll swarm on you. So um, I actually, even with my honey supers on, I'll take them off and go down through uh, just to check out what's going on down below because I don't want to lose my bees. But in most cases, uh, once they're in honey mode, if you keep giving them enough room, don't let them run out of room, um, you're pretty well off. Uh, um, now, after you put on the first honey super, now this might be like second year stuff here, you, you might uh, get to the second honey super. So it's the same thing, you're checking every week. If you get to the second honey super, you just take this off. And in a lot of cases, I will under super. So I take this super off, set it aside. So a really good idea is this. If you're most of the time inspecting more than one box, just put your lid upside down on the ground, put your inner cover on top of that, and then you have a place to set your box. It's not being set in the grass, not getting dirty, uh, so they don't have to clean stuff up. Um, so if you have another, if you're putting on a second honey super, best bet to take one of the frames that are pulled with honey in them. If you're putting on frames that aren't pulled at all, put your other honey super on, put that one in the center. Put the extra blank one in the top, and then put this one on top of that other soup. Okay? Um, and that's all you do all summer. Just keep stacking boxes. I've had them as high as seven boxes high of these deep ones. Um, so, because I went through all that, I'm probably way off on my written stuff. But I'll go back. And check. Um, um, times to work your bees when you want to go into the hive. Okay, you want you want to go into the hive on nice days, not rainy days or overcast days. Nice sunny days. Uh, above 8 degrees Celsius um, and basically my banker's hours for uh, 10, 10 to 4 in that area is the best time. If that doesn't work out you can you can go in them later. I work in them right until dark but by the time it's getting close to dark you're getting pretty cranky. So better to go midday, nice day. Um, uh, another reason for going midday is all the foragers are out of the hive. So you're dealing with a lot less bees in the hive. So it's a lot easier to find the queen or look at the brood and stuff like that. If you're going at night when all the bees are back in the hive, um, it's going to be hard to see anything because there's just so many bees. There can be up to 50,000 bees in a hive. Um, when it's in, when it's going uh, full on. Anyways, now I uh, start talking about what we're doing uh, each month of the year. I just everyone gets this uh, brochure that I have here, um, and it basically talks about everything that I talk about in class. So uh, we'll start out the first of the year of January. The bees in January are in their hive in a cluster. And there's not much you can do for them. Uh, if you want, you get, if the snow's really deep, you can come and clean out the front of the hive so there will be there will be a vent at the top of the hive, a 
mounted right here in the inner cover. So when I told you in the summer you put this side down, well in the fall and winter you put this side down, okay? So that they have that vent hole at the top which lets the helps to let out the condensation. Um, and usually the bees actually use this as their entrance and exit uh, right from late fall until oh probably mid-April anyway. Um, they'll go out through the top instead of going through the bottom. Sometimes they'll use both. But, uh, okay, so This is your. This is what they look like in January. Except they have their wraps on. Okay, and you put this lid on. You pull it forward, and that gives a good air space in there for that vent to work. Um, so, pretty much the most you can do in January is keep your entrances clear. Um, some people don't even do that. They just leave them. Um, until it gets a little warmer, late February, before they start even worrying about cleaning at the front end. Uh, February is still not much you can do. Uh, make sure your entrances are clear because usually in the winter time there's some uh, frost and stuff builds up on the outer walls. So once you start getting some nice warm days in February, um, you want the water to be able to get out and so just keep that open and air circulating through it um, and that will help to move the moisture out of the hive as that frost melts. Um, March, the first half of March is pretty much like January and February uh, but Mid-March usually, I try and get out there and, and uh, see if I can just check on them and see if they're alive, basically. So, if it's, uh, I don't know, I'd pick above 6 degrees or so. In the summer I said 8 degrees, but in the winter I'd say at least 6 degrees. Cause, um, that's just sort of what I go by. So go out and do whatever you have to do to get your hive wrap off or you can even, you can just, um, you can lift the lid and I don't even lift this cover, I just sort of see if the bees are alive and try and figure out if there's any food in there. Okay, one way of doing that is taking your hive tool and just shoving it down and into the comb uh, in through this top hole. Or if you had to, you could crack the lid and look underneath. If it's a nice enough day, if it's a cold day, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't crack anything. You just want to sort of see if your bees are alive, see if they have enough food. Um, So you just want to find out if your bees are dead or alive. Uh, if they're alive at that point, I put a pollen patty on. Now, like I say, it needs to be a warm enough day. Um, sometimes I'll cut the bottom pollen patty lengthways or protein patty, and I'll shove it in through here. Um, other times I'll just lift it very quickly, put it on, and drop it again. That's they're not necessary. People, you don't have to use uh, protein patties or you can wait until later on in the year. My reason for using them is because I need my bees to go up early in the year so I can make nucleus home. But most people aren't trying to do that. So. Um, another thing you can do is if you see that they're low on food is put uh, you can put a piece of newspaper across the back of the frame and just pour some dry sugar on there. We'll call it the mountain camp method. 
my uncle says that's my grandfather's method, but he said if somebody wants to give it a name, let them go ahead. <laughs> um, if I actually mix a one-to-one -one syrup and, and try and get it on around that time. And so the protein patty that I put on, uh, it simulates pollen, because that's their source of protein. And the syrup that I put on, the one-to-one -one syrup, it is like uh, nectar. So it's sort of like you're creating like a fake environment. <laughs> you're creating a, a you're, you're making the bees think as if there's a, some nectar flowing and some pollen and then that'll start to clean uh, laying eggs and, and starting the new population for the new year. Um, so you just stimulate it. So if you get in there and you end up putting sugar on or something like that, uh, you've done your bees a favor if they need it. If they don't need it, you're probably okay not to do anything. Um, first half of, of April, it's not much different than March. You just want to make sure they have food. Um, it's not usually many days you can get into them anyways at that point. Um, unless it's a weird spring like this one with warm fairly early. Uh, the second half of the month is a little different. It's warmer. The bees can get out of the hive. And they load on a cleansing flight, which is we have to avoid because they've been stuck in the hive since uh, last November. So they have to be able to get out and take a poop. Um, so they can get out if you if you get the opportunity. If there's a bunch of nice days. You can actually get in and go through the hive and just see that everything is working right. Make sure the queen is laying. And make sure there is a queen. Sometimes they'll lose a queen over the winter. So you just go in and, and sort of clean out a bunch of dead bees or whatever. And you could take your take the supers off and clean the bottom board off. And that helps your bees out a lot because that makes it so that instead of Cleaning the bottom board, they can be doing something else that's going to benefit you. Um, now, if you did start feeding in March, you need to continue feeding until there's some sort of source that they can get at. Uh, because once you start feeding and stimulating them to make brood, then they start making brood. And if you stop feeding them, they could go through all their stores feeding that brood and actually starve to death before um, there's a nectar and pollen flow. So if you start feeding, you need to keep feeding. But keep an eye on them that they don't get packed down or something. Um, usually they're pretty good. Um, and at the end of the month, the end of April, uh, you can take off your winter wraps and just, yeah, uh, you'll find the bees are mostly using the upper entrance until you got that bottom cleaned off and then sometimes they'll start using the bottom one. So basically in the, when you're able to go in in April, you're looking to see if there's brood, you're looking to see if there's a queen, okay? If, if there's a queen in there, usually there's brood, okay? If you see a queen but there's no brood, or if you don't have, there may not be enough bees in there even for her to be laying. They'll sort of hold off because uh, if there's not enough bees to support, to keep the brood warm, she just won't lay anything. So, um,
so in the late part of April, you could also start doing your uh, fowl brood mix. Now that's something that you have to get from the veterinarians now. And <coughs> it's just a powder. And how you apply it is take your lid off, take your inner cover off. You'll have to keep it in this position for them to access it. Um, and you just this powder mixed with uh, icing sugar or fine sugar. You put uh, three tablespoons uh, three times in five day intervals. But you put it on the outside frames and across maybe the front or the back of the frames. You don't put it in the center because that's where your brood is. And if the uh, fowl brood mix gets into where the larvae are, it can kill them. So it's called fowl brood mix or oxytetracycline, or there's other oxytet um, variants that the vets now give people. Uh, we used to sell it, but we can't anymore. Uh, veterinarians. Um, so you put that on. Okay, and then comes May, and this month is a little more of a challenge. The first two weeks, you need to keep an eye on how much room they have, because there's more and more bees hatching out. Okay, um, there's still in the first half there still isn't much nectar, um, but there could be depending on where you are. I know places that are different than where I am, they had nectar two weeks earlier and they're not even an hour drive from me. So, <clears throat> and they're actually a little further north. Than me. So it just depends on where you are when the nectar hits them when they start filling up their hive. And that's why you have to keep an eye on them. Um, you also need to check for Varroa at that time. Um, so the way you check for Varroa is with one of these little jars. This jar has two sides with the lid in between, and right here, I don't know if you can see it, I can't see it. Yeah, you can. There's a screen here, okay? So what you do is you just put a little bit of uh, alcohol in here or some people use windshield washer fluid or something like that um, and then you set that down. you take the lid off and you open this up make sure that um, grab a frame, probably a frame of brood, your best bet. Take a really good look at it because you don't want your queen in this jar. And you just go like this and then you scoop these up until this is about like, a third full. And then you just screw this on here. Like this. And you dump the liquid in onto the bees. And then you shake it, shake it, shake it for two or three minutes at least. And then flip it back the other way so that all the dead bees are left up in here. And down in here is all the liquid and the varroa mite will be in the bottom. So that many bees is around 300 bees. Okay, You're trying to keep this below 2% if you can. So Six, six mites. If there's six mites in more than six mites in here, you need to treat. Um, I just treat anyway because the treatment I use isn't that hard on them. So um, 
but if you have more than six in here, you need to treat. And actually, if you have one or two in here, I would still treat because this is the best opportunity in this day. Um, it's not like you don't have your honey supers on yet. The bees are building up. It's your first hatch out. You can, you can knock a lot of them down. So, um, so there's multiple different ways of treating. There's like uh, Formic Pro uh, uh, strips, which is a uh, formic acid in a, uh, a gel pad, and you put two gel pads. Um, you take your top box off. First, you set your lid on the ground like that. Unless you can make a special stand or something, then that's even better. You pop your top box off, then you lay your two pads in the center here uh, in the brood area. And there'll be brood in the top, most likely, too. You just take this and put it back on. And you leave that for 14 days and that treatment is done. Um, you go in the back and take the gel pads out and dispose them. You can just dispose them in your uh, compost. You know, compost. Um, so that's, that's the, this is the one that I promote the most. It uh, works fairly easily. Um, it's considered organic. Um, and you can actually use uh, Formic Pro if you have Honey Supers on, which is this is the only product you can use with Honey Supers on, is the Formic Pro. Um, everything else is illegal uh, as far as that goes. And there's other things Uh, Apistan or Apovar. Here's an Apovar. This got ten strips in it. So you use these strips go down into the into the brood area. You put for every box you put two strips. So if you have a double hive like this. That would be four strips. So this is a, a thing of ten. So this would be like this would be two doubles and maybe a single hive. Um, now these are this is an insecticide, um, and what happens is the bees will walk on these strips, and then they'll walk around the hive, walking on each other and everything. And so what that does is it gets this insecticide on the mites and it kills the mites. Now this is a this treatment is 42 days and then and you can't put your honey supers on when this is on and you can't put your honey supers on immediately after this goes out. I believe it's 10 days, but the instructions are on everything uh, that you get. So, like the April bar, it's got the instructions on it. Uh, the Formic Pro has the instructions on it, in it, also in it, a brochure in it telling you how to do it. Um, that Formic Pro can actually be used two different ways. One's a 14 day treatment, the other one is one pad at a time, so it's for 10 days, so it ends up being 20 days, but like I said, that one you can put on with the Honey Supers on, this one you can't, so you got to get started in early April in this one, in order to get uh, to the point where you put your Honey Supers on, usually a rule of thumb is about 
the first of June to put your honey supers on, but it all depends on how strong your bees are. Okay, there's another, uh, a couple other ways of treating. Um, this is the one that I use the most, and it's uh, just a pad, it's like a pad that you get in your in a meat in the bottom of a meat tray that soaks up the blood from the meat. Um, we use it differently. We use it with uh, stuff called formic acid, which is the same as what's in the formic pro. Um, so you put the formic acid into a bucket that you can dip this in or a tray, and you soak this in it for it only takes a couple minutes, and uh, then. You pull it out, I pull it out with tongs and put it on the top of my hive. But you have to do that at least three times. I usually do it four or five. Um, but you need to do it at least three times. Um, if you put it on once every five days, uh, it's for three times. So it's basically the same as when you use the uh, Oxytetracycline or the foul group mix. It's three times five in five day intervals. Uh, they both work at the same time. Um, now, when you're dealing with formic acid, even with when you're dealing with the formic pro, you should have like chemical gloves um, or goggles, okay, just in case. Now, if you're very careful. You can probably do it without, but it's suggested. Uh, we also, there's also, uh, what do you call it, respiratory masks. Um, you can use this for the, the formic acid stuff, but I think this is more important uh, for the oxalic acid, which is another one that you can do. Um, Oxalic acid is a powder, so this, this is a kilogram of uh, oxalic acid, that would last you forever, <laughs> with one on one or two eyes, but um, it can be used in two different ways. One way is uh, the suggested way, which is a vaporizer, um, don't have one right here. So, a vaporizer is a little thing that you take and you put a little, the spoon comes with it, the vaporizer, and you put just a scoop full of oxalic acid in the vaporizer, and you shove it in the front of the hive, and you block everything off um, for the vapor and it, so you shove a cloth in and put your vaporizer in the center and then you touch it to a battery or if you have an electric one you have to pull the trigger and it uh, vaporizes that acid, that oxalic acid and it will fill your hive with fumes and you just leave that blocked up for a couple minutes and then you let it you let it uh, go from there and that kills for a lot as well. But it is, I've heard, because I haven't used it, it's very hard when you end up downwind of it, very hard on your lungs. So that's why the respirators are here. Um, anyway, uh, another way to do that, that you can do in the fall but not in the spring, is a, a drizzle, which you mix it with one to one sugar syrup, and you drizzle, I believe, it's five milliliters on every seam of bees that's in your hive. Um, so you just drizzle it on, on the bees, and the acid ends up on the bees, and but you can only do that in the fall. Um, because they won't consume it in the fall, but in the spring 
they will consume it at speed and it's not good for them, so you shouldn't uh, do that in the spring. Um, I don't know what other ways you can treat Berberoa. There's uh, also Bayerol, which is sort of like the Apophen, maple bar. Um, but some people say it doesn't work as good as it should. So, um, okay, so May is also the time um, that your swarming starts. So, mid May, um, you really got to start watching them, making sure they have enough room. It's really not time to put on the honey super yet, but if you have to, do it. Um, so, one of the things you can do in May is make an increase in the bees. And um, so, a lot of people, some people would just take a few frames and stuff out and make a nucleus colony. And so, basically, a four frame colony. So, you'd have to fill it. You'd have to have some honey in it, and full of bees, and some open. Best way to look at it is to put in eggs if you can. <coughs> eggs and open larvae, because um, the the larvae that they actually build a queen out of is so small, it's like easier to see the egg than it is to see the small larvae. So. If you go with eggs, you know in the next you know, three days they're going to turn into larvae anyway. The bees will make them amazing. But you can just take that box and separate it, move it into a different yard. That's one way of doing it. Um, another thing called a walk away split. So you would just take, um, you can get another bottom board. This is called a solid bottom board. You get just get a bottom board um, and you could okay so one way of doing it is just put a bottom board beside your hive. Okay? Face it the opposite direction. Um, go through your hive and Go through your hive until you find the queen, okay? And keep track of what box she's in. So you find the queen, you move the box, and you just give it a spin and put it on this bottom board here with the queen in it, okay? Leaving a full box of bees here, okay? But you have to make sure there's at least eggs and young larvae in there, and I would have some other tap root in there as well, and it's full of bees, okay? And then you just put a, a lid and inner cover on that one. It's facing the other way, but it has to have the queen in it. You can't leave the queen in this box, because all the bees from that box will turn around and come back to this one, leaving all that brood and stuff to get chilled in there. So, as long as the queen's in that box, the bees will stick with her. Okay, there will be some field bees that come back and come into this hive, but this hive will be good and strong, and you'll make your own queen. Um, or you can buy a queen and put it in there, which is a little faster because from the point of the egg being laid until a new queen is created, and then the new queen goes out and mates and comes back, which there's only about a 70% chance that she'll ever make it back, um, then it's, it's 28 days from the point of the egg until she's in here laying, uh, laying eggs again and starting to hide rolling rain. This one's never going to stop. Okay, so if you move that over there with the queen in it and it's full of bees, put another box on top. This one too, if it was full of bees, 
put another box on top. So each of them are in two boxes right off the bat. Um, that's one way of doing it. Another way, better way, is probably just picking up one of the boxes, put it on a new bottom board, lid, inner cover, and screen it in and take it a couple miles away. Leave it there for a couple of weeks and then bring it back. Maybe at a friend's house or whatever. Um, and if, if you do that where you move them right out of the yard to a totally different yard, you don't have to care which one the queen is in. So if you can't find the queen, do that. Take it away. And then and then it won't matter if the queen's here or the queen's there. Which everyone doesn't have the queen, they'll make a new queen. But as soon as you split them, if they're that strong, put another box on them. Um, because <laughs> even the one that has the queen, if you don't put the second box on and give them room, they can swarm. Um, so. Now, usually, if you don't, um, if you don't split, um, uh, you could always, you could always, if you did that split, you could always just to create more room on top, put a queen excluder on top, and and start putting honey supers on. But you have to know that when you're running box uh, bees in a single box. Uh, they have way more tendency to swarm. Okay, so you have to just sort of keep track of them a lot better. I find um, I actually do run most of my hives in a single box uh, for part of the summer, um, but you really have to keep track of them and keep them to, to keep them from swarming. Uh, otherwise, like if you don't split, most of the time by the first of June. You're ready to put the honey supers on. And it all depends on the year too, and the, when the nectar flow starts and all that. Um, now, because if you split these in the middle of May, okay, by the first of June, they probably won't quite be ready to go into uh, honey, but it'll be close. It might be in the middle of June before you put your honey supers on. But you, you just have to judge it and. and keep track of them and see where they're at. Um, so in June, um, if you didn't split your hive, check and make sure there's room. Um, if you're if they're getting full of bees, um, get your uh, medications, make sure your medications are done. Um, then put a clean excluder on and put your honey super on. Okay. You, you still need to watch your, your hives for swarming for the next few weeks. Probably by the end of June, they're pretty good. Um, they'll slow down the tendency to swarm. And once you get them up into the honey supers and traveling through that clean excluder, if you choose to use one, some people don't. But if you um, get them traveling through it, it gets way easier to keep them um, from swarming because they consider that more room that they have up there, <clears throat> even though the queen can't get up there. Um, and if you, so that's why I always suggest to run in a double box, it's just way easier to manage them. It might be a lot more work to go through them, but they don't have as big of a tendency to swarm. Um, so, like you can, a lot of times you can get away without going through them much after they got the honey super one. So, um, but in, in the month of June, like you're looking at still worrying about swarming. 
So from from that point, from the point that you put on your honey supers, the main thing is making sure they have room. Just keep giving them room. Um, and keep stacking honey supers on until um, and just so that they have room. If they start filling the honey super, or if it gets just about full, put another one on. Um, it's not as hard for them to keep warm in the summertime, so a uh, little extra room doesn't hurt. It's not great because sometimes they won't pull out the whole frame or something. They'll just pull out bits and pieces here and there, and it's a bit of a pain. But um, now in July, you just uh, keep giving them room and by mid-July uh, you may have some honey supers that are full. So this is of course it, this is all talking about like a, a normal year of beekeeping. This isn't starting with and this is long you're not going to get multiple uh, honey supers full. Okay but um, in mid-July you could have some of your honey supers full and capped and you could take them off and actually uh, spin them out and get some get your honey uh, sales started. Um, but when you take your honey supers off don't just take your honey super off and then put the lid back on because you just took all the room. right? So if you're taking your honey super off you need to have something to put back on there to give them room or they're going to start the swimming process almost immediately um, because you just squish them down. Um, so just remember to make sure they have room even if you're taking their honey. Okay? Um, so all through summer they just keep expanding, 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 expanding. And you just got to keep ahead of them, but not too far ahead of them that it makes it uh, hard for them to manage all the space. Um, uh, so you, you might want to check your mite levels too in midsummer. Um, might be a good idea because sometimes uh, when the hive is full, they're creating a lot of brood, and there's a lot of brood comb in there, which is where the varroa lays their eggs. And, and so, the more bees that are hatching out, the more varroa that's hatching out as well. And sometimes uh, your your mites can really get away from you in the summer. So just keep an eye on that as well. When you're taking your honey, don't think of it as stealing your honey. You're really not stealing it. Um, you do a lot of work to get the honey and you take care of them. They're your babies. So you just make sure they don't have too many mites chewing on them and you make sure that they have food when they need it. And then, so you, they just give you something back. And sometimes that can help pay for uh, all the money that you put in them um, because you have to buy the medication and you have to uh, uh, keep track of them and putting more equipment on top and stuff like that. So, um, in August you just continue monitoring them for space and at the end of the month take off all your honey supers and extract the honey. Uh, at that at that point, they're they're not as much in a swarming mode. So you got two boxes there, and you got four or five honey supers on top. You just take those honey supers off. Believe it or not, they'll fit in those bottom boxes, and uh, they might beard the front of it like crazy. But you know what? They'll uh, they end up fitting in there, and they don't swarm. So. Um, now uh, when I keep saying taking the honey off, let me show you this little thing I guess. Just one way of getting the bees out of the super, the honey super, 
Um, you could take each frame out and sweep it off with a bee brush or some long grass or something. But um, one of there's multiple different types of bee escapes, but this is one uh, Quebec bee escape, I call them. Uh, everything seems to have multiple names these days because people change the names, but uh, they're a Quebec bee escape that was the original name for them. So what you do is you so you you have your honey super on here. What you do is just crack the honey super. If you had your lid on the ground again, you set your super off onto there. You could probably leave this on, but no problem. Would. So I just take it, tap it on the ground in front of the hive, and it will fall off, and you'll get it back into the hive. You take this with the screen down, and you put it on like this. And then you just put your honey super back on. Come back in 24 hours, all the bees have gone down through, and they can't get back up. Works at the same way a minnow trap works. It's like it's, it has pointed ends so the bees come up. This is a 5 16th space, so it's just big enough for them to go through. And they get out, but once they get out, they can't figure out how to get back in. Um, so they work really great, and they save you a lot of uh, stings and stuff because you're not sweeping the bees and rolling them. And, and uh, so it's a lot a lot nicer than um, it's a lot nicer than just uh, sweeping them off or whatever. Some people blow them off with a like a bee blower or a leaf blower. There's another thing you can get that's uh, called a plume board. So it's a board that goes on the top of the hive, and you put the chemical on it and you put it on the top and the bees don't like the chemicals so they force themselves down into the bottom. So, and then you can just carry them off. Um, so the first of September or before, some people will start the middle of August um, to treat for varroa um, because you want to kill as many of the mites as you can because the more that are in the cells with the bees, chewing on the bees, those are your winter bees that are being born at that time around the 1st of September. So you don't want those bees that have to go through you know, all those months uh, to be chewed on by mites. So, um, but the only way you can treat with your honey supers on is that form a crow. So that's one way you can start in the middle of August to treat. Um, I usually take all my supers off and then I treat and like I say I use these little pads with formic acid on them. Um, it's a little more dangerous of a way to do it because you have to deal with the liquid formic acid. And I have had the skin on my feet uh, peel right off before because I I uh, dumped someone by accident or kicked a pan or something. Um, so the other options are actually uh, a little more uh, safe. Um, in the and in the fall, like you're talking about September, uh, you could actually treat with apivar or apistan if you're okay with that. Um, like I say, it's a chemical treatment. It's a it's a insecticide but it doesn't really hurt the bees it just kills the mite so um, you can put it on for 42 days it's not affected by temperature which is a good thing about it outstanding the virus they were all they're not affected by temperature so um, whereas any of the formic acid uh, treatments are the formic pro those little pads um, 
they're affected by the temperature because they have to be a certain temperature to give off the fumes from the acid. Um, formic acid is actually found in honey. It's naturally occurring in honey, just not at a high enough level that will kill those plants. So that's what that's part of the reason I use formic acid. Um, it's more organic, in my opinion. Um, it's up to you what you use. Okay, and you also need to put on the foul brood mix or Oxitec cycling again um, with three uh, tablespoons and five the interval three times. Um, that's, and then you're done your uh, fall treatment. If you want to, there's a thing called fumigillum B, uh, which you can get again. They actually quit making it for a few years, but um, it goes in their feed. So in the fall, you feed a two to one syrup, so two parts sugar, one part water. Um, and you put, you can put the fumigillum in it, and it's uh, it's treat for nausea, which is a type of dysentery that they get. Um, if they get it, you'll know. Um, they'll just turn the whole inside of the hive black with their feces. So um, I haven't had a lot of problem with it. I have treated, and then they quit making it, so I quit treating. <laughs> now they're making it again. I'm trying to decide what I want to do um, because I find that my bees aren't. aren't uh, affected by it too much. So, um, who knows, maybe next winter it will be awful, but we'll find out. Um, so, usually around here we find about the mid-September mark, we run out of nectar. So, if your hives don't have enough honey in them, uh, you'll need to feed them. A two to one syrup mix, two parts sugar to one part water, it's just like regular table sugar, or you can get uh, organic sugar too, it's up to you. Um, so you you want them, I actually weigh my hives, so what I do is I, I put a ratchet strap around the whole thing, tighten it up really good, then I take my bathroom scale and I'll, and I'll, put it, I'll lift up the back of the hive and I'll put it under the back, and then I'll tip the hive until it starts Peter, and then check the weight. And a good winter weight is anywhere from 120 pounds up on double. That's the double of the two deep boxes. Um, and that's what I suggest for Northern Ontario. Lots of people are starting to run single when they're having success with it. Uh, that part's up to you. I still try and get the second box on. I do a few singles through winter, but uh, with varying success, maybe it's me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I did have good success last winter with, with singles, but I, I don't put a lot in. I just put, I wouldn't even put probably 10% of my bees would be on singles. Um, so you check for varroa mites if you want to. Or you can just treat it in case for it. Uh, you could medicate your syrup and put it on. They need the four liters of syrup with humigillum B in it. If you're going to do that. Um, and your oxytetracycline, which is the powdered sugar on the top, that's September. Okay? And then you're also at the same time trying to get them up to weight for winter. Once it gets cold, they quit putting feed in. Okay. Once you hit mid-August, if you have frames that aren't full, shove them in the center of the brood chamber because they don't pull much after uh, probably mid-August. So you got to get those pulled for them to fill them full of honey. Okay, if your two boxes aren't full yet. Uh, then again, if you're going to run a single, or maybe they haven't pulled out enough, so you just fire them into a single. That, that's an option. Um, that might work out. Um, uh, you, 
you can, in October, you can still try and feed them if they need the feed. Um, I've had hives go up to 150 pounds. Um, and, but if anything, about 120. I've had them come through lighter than that, but uh, that's a comfortable mark for me. He's 120 pounds. Um, so in October it's getting cooler. Uh, and you want to have, try and get them fed before October because you don't want the feed in your cells with open cappings because um, you need it to be capped over because the moisture that comes out of those cells that are capped over with, with wax um, it just adds to more condensation in your hive in winter. Um, so it's important to get them up to a good weight in September. Uh, and then October is just making sure they're, they're pretty good. You don't really want to wrap them in October. Some people up north will. Um, because they're further north. Uh, so they'll wake up in the Cochrane and up there, I imagine they, they, uh, they wrap earlier than I do. Um, I'll wrap right around the end of uh, October, November, usually I'm done wrapping by Christmas time. Um, now, when you're wrapping for winter, there's more than just wrapping the outside of the hive. You have to wrap the outside. And let's get a regular, config a regular configuration here. Just a second. screen bottom board, you'll need to put your little slider thing in the back that uh, closes off the screen. Um, and then winter time, the deep part goes down on your inner cover so that that vent is there. Um, this is a when you walk up to your hive, this is what it's like. Okay, we'll take this off. And one of the main pieces of insulation is right here. Now, I actually have pieces of styrofoam that I have cut for the top here. Um, this is uh, something that comes you can get them, they come from the same company that makes it be cozy, just a pillow um, with insulation in a bag. It doesn't cover the whole thing, but they say that's what they do and they've been doing it for years and so um, that's just the size of it. So be cozy. Um, there's multiple different ways of, of, of uh, wrapping. I'm just showing you this box. Some people will use styrofoam on the whole box. But if you do that, I suggest that you put uh, like tar paper or something black on the outside um, just to attract the sun. Right? Now, the bee cozies, when they're new, they're in a nice. Uh, they're in a nice round um, they're all wrapped up like this and I find it easier to put them back to that point and then put them on because you're forcing all the air out so the air sort of fills the inside um, so you just unroll that and leave your inner cover on but you can't have your lid on at this point. Okay. I usually try and keep the seam at a corner 
I don't know why. I just think that makes sense to me. Um, we just take this and pull it down. down as far as you can get it and if you're using a single you can actually get a single one of these so it's a shorter you just fix on the single one so you have your insulation on the top here you have this cozy on here now you you take and you put a nail or a screw right here in the wood to hold this wrap down so that that vent doesn't get covered up and then you put your lid on and like I say the screw here to hold that down so this vent then is and, and pull this forward so this vent is now open and now down here I do the same thing I put a screw or a nail to hold the bottom up so that it just keeps the bottom open keeps the top open there's ventilation that can go through the hive to keep the condensation down. Um, that's winter wrapping. Where am I? Uh, so the commercial wraps are easy. They're easy. You can take your time uh, in southern Ontario. I know a lot of people just wrap with tar paper and staple it to the hive and that's it. That's all they get. And, and, and they're covered. Uh, insulation. Um, I've I've seen things that I've seen some amazing wraps that are just over the top, um, which is great if if you have time. Uh, think up something and and figure out the best way to wrap your bees to keep the wind off them. That's the main thing that you're doing. Uh, another thing is uh, having something black on it. If it's minus 40 and they're getting hit by the sun, um, they're a little warmer than minus 40. Because <laughs> uh, the, the sun makes a huge difference. The, having that uh, solar heat uh, warming them up a little bit helps. Right? And like I say, this wrap doesn't come off until like about the end of April. You just keep it on. Or if you have to take it off to inspect, take it off to inspect, put it back on if you can. Um, sometimes I've left them off um, after about mid-April, and it didn't seem to hurt them too much, but I really think it's better to leave them off. Um, the, the main part is the ventilation top and bottom, keep the condensation out. Um, and also mice love beehives in winter so there's a couple different ways you can stop that there's a metal a metal mouse guard like what's on this hive we'll just take this off so this metal mouse guard can you see it? okay when you have it in this way the bees can get out the hole, and that's the way you want to have it the whole time you're hiding in one spot. Uh, the only reason for having it the other way, this way, is if you're going to move the bees. So if you're buying bees here and you say you want them in your hive kit, and you buy one of these uh, entrance reducer mouse guards, um, we can just screen them in just by using one of these. So it just goes in here, you push down, and it blocks off the entrance so the bees can't get in. Have it? Plus this thing was quick. I don't know what the fuck in. Um, in. In between the filing cabinet and that thing. Okay, so. Um, Ventilation is the uh, most important, and the most guard I was talking.
talking about. So that's the one mouse guard. Here's the other one. So this one here, it has a smaller entrance or a larger entrance. And that's only 5 sixteenths high, which in the B space is 5 sixteenths. Okay, so that just sit. So if you didn't have this one, this one would just fit just like this. And depending on how much ventilation you want, it turns so that um, it blocks it off. Okay, so you can have either one of those spaces depending on how strong or how much ventilation you want. Um, that's that, and in December, what you do with your bees is nothing because it's Christmas. So you don't have Christmas with your uh, family. We don't know what each year will bring when it comes to beekeeping. Just enjoy them, and they'll because they're, they're fascinating and enjoyable to uh, keep. Okay, so I'm going to show you some of the equipment. I'm not doing this to sell you anything. I'm doing this to show you some of the things and how they work. Okay. Um, now, this hive has on the bottom, there are This is a, called a bottom board. This is a screen bottom board, so it has this plastic weight thing. So in the summer, you can use this for ventilation. Okay. You can also put this in. Okay. And people will do a mite drop count. So they'll take this out, clean it out, put it back in, and then there is a natural thing that the bees do, and the mites end up falling on that. So people will go uh, go back in two days after they put that in and just check and see how many mites are on it. It's not a great way to count mites. This way is, I know people hate killing 300 bees to find out how many mites are on the other 50,000 bees that are in their hive, but uh, it's the only real good accurate count. Okay. Um, there's also an ether roll, which is you take a jar, put the bees in there, and you spray ether in the can and close it up in a jar, and you roll the jar, and the mites will stick to the outside of the jar. I've never done it before, seen a few videos, but, <laughs> um, now this is a solid bottom board. This doesn't have any ventilation. Um, but I find they work just as good. Um, this one's a Cadillac, of course. This one's you know, the minivan or whatever. But this is what comes with the hive kit that we sell normally. Uh, not the, the deluxe leader BTP package comes with the screen bundle. But the difference is, you know, one's 10 bucks more than the other, but it's got more features, right? So that's the reason for that. Um, this is the lid, and I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, this is an inner cover. They come in different types. Um, every company seems to make their own, and this is like a standard one. It's a little different than this. This is like a. This is what my family is used and I tweaked it for my own needs um, so I, I tweaked it my uncle puts a smaller hole here because he feeds with buckets I'll sometimes feed with a jar so in the early spring just so I can take a look and see what the levels are without actually picking it up or doing anything weird so I'll put a mason jar in there uh, upside down little holes in the lid, the bees can come up and eat from it. And the way I got this hole made, it's made in a way that it comes about uh, a little less than half inch from the tops of the frame. So the bees don't have to pile up on top of each other to eat. Um, 
now in the middle of fingers. So, this is what a lot of people will use for feeding. Okay, this is a 30 pound bucket. This is a 5 kilogram bucket. I guess it depends who makes them, if you get it in metric or, or what. But <laughs> um, so this you just fill it full of syrup. Um, most of our buckets aren't like this anymore with the removable plug, but they do have a removable plug. Um, so you just take this plug out, fill it up so that you're not wrecking the seal on the pail all the time. And that just goes in there. You turn this bucket upside down. Good idea to have a container or whatever, or you can just let it glue it on the ground until gravity takes over. And then it will hold the syrup in the pail. Depends on here. But with these types of inner covers, these have to pile up on each other to get to that. Um, some people will actually set it straight on the frame, which isn't a good idea with this pull out plug because if they um, wax it down, then when you go to pull the bucket out, all the syrup holes will all in the Okay, this is the 30 pound pail, a little different. It's got this, you just cut this out so that you only ever have to seal it once so you're not wrecking the seal every time you take it off. I used to pull the lid off all the time and that's why most of mine leaked. So um, you cut this out, fill it up, put the lid back on, same thing, you dump it like this. A lot more will come out of this bucket than will come out of that bucket. You set it on. And they pile up, they go up in there and they, they eat, but you could leave this on probably for, you know, a couple weeks and they worry about it. Um, sometimes the strong hive, just those mason jars I was talking about, it'll be gone in a day. So, um, there's another feed. Here's another way to feed. Is a frame feeder. So this has like a little ladder in here, a B ladder. Goes down in. Um, so this is a frame feeder with cap and ladder. So the wooden part of the cap, and that's the ladder. Okay. It just goes in. It takes the place of the frame. Take one frame out. Put that in there. Fill it up with syrup. Uh, this takes about maybe takes a gallon of syrup. Mm. Doesn't really say. It's a single frame feeder, is what they call it. Yeah, one gallon of, of feed in there. Um, another feeder is. Hive top feeder. So this one's called a carousel feeder. It's got a plastic liner. Some people like them because they're uh, easy to clean. Um, I've also heard from people because of the plastic, it gives off condensation on the bottom. So you can cut out these little circles here. The bees can come up through the center and then they crawl down the sides of this. It's corrugated. Okay. This stays on top so that the bees can't fly out into the syrup. Um, okay. I realize that got turned. Um, the good thing with these are if your hive's not level, they can still come up the corners and eat. Okay, so. So if, if you have it on here and all your syrup runs to one side, they can still get at it because they can come up the corner. Okay. Uh, this is another type of high top meter. This one here just has the one chimney. This is called a chimney feeder. Okay. So it just has the one spot for the bees to come up. It's got a screen that goes over top. And then on the bottom, they get to crawl up through this little hole. Right? It just goes on there. Um, 
But if your hive's way out of level, it'll leave some feed in there. But it's usually not a big deal. Um, sometimes you'll get a bit of mildew in there. They, they're really not bothered by it that much. Um, there's other variations of this where the chimney might be in the center and there may be wooden slats or there's wooden slats and then people put straw in uh, for the bees to walk on. Keep them from drowning. Um, we talked about these. These are supers. So that is a deep super is what they call it. Um, or a hive body, somebody might call it, maybe. But that's the that's what I call a bee house, where the bees stay. That's their home. Everything above it is mine. <laughs> they fill a honey super. Mine. Um, I showed you the bee escape. Uh, and this other super is called a medium super. Uh, some people call them honey supers. And then this was the queen excluder that I put on underneath that honey super. You can get them both in metal and in plastic. And of course the difference is price. These are a little more expensive, a little more durable, and they're not bothered by UV light, which if you leave the plastic ones out in the sun, they might get brittle. Um, what's the other? Oxalic acid comes in more than one size. It comes in this, and it comes in a lot smaller container over there. Um, formic acid comes in one liter, comes in four liter, or twenty liter, the big boys. Um, smokers, we have three different types of smokers. Goes from this little wee sucker to this one here. We got two big ones. That's the cheaper of the two big ones. This one's a name brand. It's sort of like buying Levi's for doing uh, bees. Uh, I find they work a lot better than the cheaper model. Um, but basically the same size. Um, these little ones, they're little. Um, so they don't stay lit as long. Stuff like that. If you only had one beehive or something, it's probably worth doing this one. One or two. But these other ones will stay lit for quite a while. The entrance reducer I showed you on the front there. Um, these here are for straining honey when you extract. They've got a double sheath to them. They're a sieve. This is called double sieve. Um, also have these which are like they're just strainers that they fit over top of five gallon pail so you can pour your honey through and it just cleans it up. This is a bee brush. Not people like me use them because I need to sweep the bees off of frame um, to get to the larvae to graft to make clean. Um, but I don't know. That's the frame spacer I showed you. Oh, here's another feeder. This is a, called a Borgman feeder. Actually, that's two feeders. So this feeder fits in the front of the hive. So it fits in the front of the hive, like in there, and then uh, mason jar will screw into here. The bees travel from the inside the hive in through this channel and there's little holes in the lid that they can uh, eat through. And there's this feeder. They just call this a pop bottle feeder because the threads on it fit a pop bottle of any kind. 
so and it just slides in the front and your pop bottle screws in there with the feed in it. But another tape here. Um, this is a beetle blaster. Hopefully you don't have them near you, but down in uh, Niagara and Sussex and down in there they have high beetles. Down in all through the state there's high beetles. Um, I don't know why I carry them. But I do. We don't have them here yet. Uh, but we will have because we're just considered a pest. They're not. Uh, but if you get them, they have to be recorded. Anyway, you put a little bit of oil in the bottom of this, and it just fits right in between the frames like that. And the bees chase the beetles around inside the hive, and they'll chase them into that, and they'll die in the vegetable oil. And this here, the frame grip. So what it does is it makes it so you can hang on to the frame with one hand, where you have the other hand free. Instead of holding the frame with both hands, so you keep it stable. You just need this one. You might shake your thing and the gloves. And here's some things for extracting honey. There's a, a cold knife. Okay, let's use that. You can use it's a hot knife. Plugs in. Basically melts the cappings off, so it just, it just fits across the wood as well. Um, there's a tapping roller, which just perforates the, the capping, and then you put it in the extractor and it will come out with no holes. This is a uncapping fork, so if you, you just take it and go underneath the capping, like this, and just keep getting rid of the capping, and you can uncap with that. This is a jack scale which grades your honey. So it has little cups that you put your honey in, and then you compare it with the color uh, to tell you what kind of honey you have in color. Jack scale, it's called. This is Fielder's BT which has all sorts of good antimicrobial things in it. Um, and Honey Bee Healthy, which is just a feeding stimulant, so you want your bees to find their feed, or it's supposed to be healthy for them. I, I use it, especially when I start feeding every year, because it makes it easier for the bees to find the feed. And then once they've found it, you can sometimes lay off. Um, that's like one of those things that dad used to try to get me. Play on hook things. This I forgot to show you. It's a good little tool. We have a couple hides, you can just leave it in your bee yard. This thing here fits on the side of your hive like that, and you can hang your frames on it. Now, if you don't have that, that first frame that you pull out, you're just trying to figure out how to put it on the ground without getting ants or getting dirt on it or whatever. I usually um, Mine are usually on skid, so I'll just take the frame and I'll set it like that. And sometimes if I find the frame with the queen on it, I'll take that frame out and I'll set her against the side of the hive like that. And she'll stay there nice and calm while I go through the rest of the hive. And that way I don't have to worry about hurting her. You could do the same up here. You could find the one with the queen on it, put it here facing the hive, 
put her on facing the hive because it's uh, she likes to be in the dark better. So you wouldn't want her out here and then she'd have a problem with that and maybe jump off or something. Yeah. Which isn't good. Um, and then we have different types of frames. So we have these frames. We have beeswax frames. These frames actually have beeswax right in them. They're made from beeswax instead of plastic. These are plastic, but they're covered with um, with wax. So I'm sure there's a million other things we're missing. Right? We have about four different types of hive tools. This is called a hive tool. That's what you uh, hook on these frames and pull them out. A lot of people do it on the end. They can get the one end up, get a hold of it, and then they get get it out with their hands. So, um, so there's all sorts of other things on our website. These are the sort of the interesting things that help you with your beekeeping. But um, we have extractors and all that stuff. So I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just trying to tell you what we have. Uh, that makes your job easier. So this is uh, one of the suits too. So the hood just flips up. That's the suit. Keep changing the suit. But you could do the suit or there's just the veil like this. So it's got a screen on the front. Um, and there's just a jacket as well. That zips up. Those are necessities. Main necessities: protecting your face, protecting from yourself from getting stung, having a tool to get your frames out, and having a smoker to calm the bees. Those are the main things. I hope this helps people. We'll be sending uh, the pamphlet out, like I said, as well. And and uh, if you buy bees from us, I'm always available by phone and email and text message and all that stuff for uh, if you have any questions. Okay, thank you very much.